Please be seated. Let's get the show on the road. No, I can hear it. <clears throat> My God voice. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right. Praise the Lord. It's good to be here. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day. It's also a day for remembrance. Fifteen years ago today, we lost a lot of lives because of people that dislike some of our ideals and some values and do not agree with how we see things. So let's pray that God can bring comfort to those that were directly impacted by this tragedy. I want to share something with you this morning that is not related to that. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, I don't know if, if you guys have heard or remember. There's a, one of this philosophy uh, I don't know if I should call it conundrum, but when they say if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a noise? So I was thinking about that a few days ago, and I feel the Lord put in my heart the question of, I was going to bring props, but I thought it was going to be too much, uh, of the glass and the question of, is the glass half full or half empty? I've always been of the thinking that the, ga the glass is always half full, because I'm a very optimistic person. But as I was thinking about that, uh, the Lord reminded me that the glass is always full. It's full half of water and half with air. You can't see the air. So I was thinking and meditating on that. And, you know, it says in the scripture that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, if you think about it, if you want to make this analogy, it makes sense in my mind. Hopefully it makes sense to you. We are that glass. We accept Jesus as our Savior. Our lives are transformed. But at that moment, we're full of air. Because even though we receive the Holy Spirit, we don't have the fullness of it yet because we still need some direction. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So we study the scripture, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit that we have received, start giving us revelation, and the glass starts getting filled. And we continue to study the word, and the glass continue to get full. Granted, it's already full, it's full of our spirit, of our human thinking, but it's being filled by the revelation of God through the Holy Spirit and the water continues to grow or be poured into that glass. And that's how we grow as well in the spirit as we study the word and we continue to, to dwell in it and meditate on it and let it produce what God wants it to produce in our lives. That vessel, that glass, our body, is going to continue to get filled more with the Holy Spirit and as that process continues to happen we're able to see things differently more with our spiritual eyes than our physical eyes and that access or being able to tap into that power that we have through God 
it's going to be easier to uh, use our manifest because when we stand our ground, after that has been embedded in our heart more, it's, it's, we become more powerful. Does that make sense? scripture here and I lost it I apologize but anyway um, so if, if you think about it this is a, a continuous process but then you look at the glass again it's getting filled with water and then water pours out of it well maybe that's because we're in a trial and then we start shifting back to our earthly body and to our physical mind, but then we go back to this and we continue to study on this and the water goes back up and continues to rise in that glass. So I was thinking about that and I guess my point for this is uh, it doesn't matter if, you're, if you feel, if you feel, sorry, that the glass is half empty or half full, know that even though you can't see him, God is always there. Yeah. So you're always full. Yeah. It's just a matter of going back to his word for that revelation and manifestation of the Holy Spirit to take a hold of you. So then you start seeing that water rise yeah. in that glass. Amen. That's my message. So. Thank you.
And the Lord brought something to my mind about, you remember when the disciples were given dominion, went out two by two, and the little boy that had the epilepsy or whatever it is, the demon, and it wouldn't come out. And they couldn't cast it out. And I was really thinking about that and meditating on that. And the Lord pointed out that they had dominion all the time. But Satan tested their dominion. He, he tested to see if they realized they had dominion. And they did. That, that was all it took because they're making it. Well, we can't cast that one out. That's why Jesus said to them, oh, be of little faith. And I can hear him saying that to us. And Jane and I were talking about cancer coming back on people. So many times it comes back. And it's it, cancer is a spirit. And I'm telling you, it is a spirit. I, they can call it disease, but we know Jesus defined everything negative as being demonic from, right. from the devil. So it's right. from the devil. And, you know, it gets, it, it leaves, and then it gets more powerful ones, and they come back. But we still have to declare dominion over them. Right. You can't come back. Do you understand that? You can't come back. Then, then somebody said, well, 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 what do you do if they call your bluff? It's not calling your bluff. It's calling Jesus Christ of Nazareth's bluff. Yes, that's right. <laughs> All of our authority. All of our power. Somehow Satan always tries to isolate us and make us think it's between him and us. Mm -hmm. right. Well, if it is, we're doomed. We're done. But we have to go back and say, no, I don't care what it looks like. You have no authority over us. Right. He hasn't had authority over every, anyone in here except for the blood. That's right. Mm -hmm. But we have to encourage one another in that and yeah. believe it. Because if we don't, then we're like the disciples, and mm -hmm. we've got a truckload, and it's going to lose our, we're losing out. And I think that's what's happened to church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't believe the authority they have, or the power they have. Mm -hmm. Just don't believe it.
think the situation that, that happened a few years back, um, I know a lot of people said that the church was packed out after 9-11 happened, and then it waned. Uh, you could tell that was just a religious act on most people's parts because six, eight weeks later, it was back to the same old, same old. It was a warning of things to come. It was going to be a shaking. It's going to be a shaking. We understand that. And we're so we're not of this world. And <clears throat> we need to help people understand God's heart in these situations that this is a fallen world. We know it's a fallen world. And there's going to be other things coming on. These are the last days. And he said it was going to start shaking and happening. But <clears throat> the point is, where's God's love in this? I mean, the kingdom to be furthered is now. The time is now. When I see when I see uh, Dean getting prayed for Friday night and getting set free from things, um, and then also other people in the place, just like Sheila was talking about, um, and then James, he's go, he goes to a uh, uh, basically like a it was almost like a party situation down there in Winterset and stuff for drums, but he's actually ministering. You may not understand that. But one of his sidekicks posted a thing on there that there's so there's marijuana and everything you can smell on there and everything else. There's all that kind of junk going on at this thing. But James was there ministering. Mm -hmm. Didn't he ask us to go? That's right. Didn't he tell us to go? Yeah. So yeah, James is a little tired this morning because he got back up four thirty or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord made a way. He got back, but he actually went down and ministered yeah. down in Winterset. So um, just take that step of faith. Now's the time. We're going to be pulled off, but this is basically a uh, base, uh, basic camp training camp uh, to prepare to go out, not to stand here and, and, and pat each other on the back, but to go out and lay hands on people and, and get them healed and saved. And so there is a shift, and, and I, that word's getting overused a lot. I see a lot of ministers using shift. I feel like I'm driving a Red Ranger transmission. This thing knows all about that. Um, so much shifting going on. But anyway, God has given us a mandate here on Eastern Gate, and I know there are other places around the city watching us, this little church here on the east side, to see what our next move is. So are we going to show the world what, what God's up to? Amen. 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 Right. Amen. Okay. You want to say something? Yeah. There's a scripture that Jesus says, don't you think that if I ask my father, he'll send 12,000 angels to my aid? Yeah. Wow. Michael listed it. Nice. All right. Well, if, yeah, Sheila. One more. Okay. <laughs>
raise the money for child support or whatever. So, I mean, this is this is a big shift, but again, it's just declaring the word and it's changing. I believe it's changing here. I'm going to tell you. So, those are very, very big promises in our life and in this baby's life and in my daughter's life that she comes to the Lord. Amen. 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 Um, Friday night, I was prayed for an in vitro better emotion. Um, a little bit better physically, too. Um, and also, I uh, wanted to remind everybody, I know I've said this before, but it's just been on my heart that we would remember our dreams that the Lord gives us yes. and that we would seek him for the answers, the revelation of it. Yes. What is that dream about? He was telling us in the night all these things, and a lot of times, Well, let's stand this morning <clears throat> and let's come to the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for bringing us here to be gathered in your name. We thank you, Lord, for the word that you give us, the word that you speak through all of your people, a word, Father, that we embedded in our hearts and wait for the revelation through the Holy Spirit that you have given us, Lord, when we accepted you as our Lord and Savior. We thank you, Father, because we know that when we speak your word, the word has power, and it'll accomplish what you said that it will accomplish. Because when you said that you have said that it will not go back to you void, but it will do what you said it will do. We pray, Father, for the promise of healing that you have made us, that you have given us, Lord, through the covenant, through your Holy, through your only Son, Jesus, Father. We thank you. We declare that the healing is manifesting right now. And those that need it, we declare, Father, through your word, the dominion that you have given us in this earth, to declare and speak your words over all of the circumstances of our lives, for us to be freed from the things that oppress us from this world, Lord. We thank you, Father, because we know that you're always there for us, and you continue to fill our cup, Father, with the revelation that you give us through your spirit. We thank you, Father, for all of the promises that you have made, all of the blessings, the things that you have done in our lives in the past, the things that you're doing right now, and the things that you will continue to do. We ask, Father, that you continue to prepare us as we go out into this world to share your word with those that don't know who you are, giving us the opportunity to step out, take the step of faith, and minister to those that are so desperately seeking you or those that you are calling but haven't heard your call. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for bringing us here and for giving us the mandate to make disciples of all the nations. We pray, Father, that the word that has been spoken over the lives of those that you have given a word to manifest and that your will is done on this earth, Lord, as it is in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. the other night but as we pray for those that aren't here I'd just like the centurion that 
fill the gap for one of his servants. Just like we're talking about those in our family that need a touch right now. Lifting up Cindy also. Let this, let this song go forth declaring that Jesus is touching them right where they're at right now. Please turn your phones or try them on vibrate. Sing to and I'll speak the word this morning. Will you not revive, revive us again, again that your people may rejoice in, in you? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, that I am not conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebuke the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now resolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Don, will you mind taking the offering, please? Mr. Wyckoff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Oh, Lord, yes, Lord, we're so thankful to be here today, Father. We just praise your mighty name. God, we thank you for the revelation that you are giving the truth. These are thrilling times, exciting times. These are the times the apostles long to see, and they see it now in us. Lord, we just praise your name. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray that you'll bless this offering, bless the remainder of the service. May it be great and mighty, and may we all come away with what we need. In Jesus' name Jesus. we pray.
Praise God. Praise God. Give the Lord a big hand this morning. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Roberto. And thank you, Mike and worship team. Thanks, everybody, for sharing your testimonies and words of encouragement, as well as your prayer requests. Praise God. Appreciate you all being here this morning. God bless all of you. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And we're just going to get right into the word of God this morning. Sheila, if you would, I'd like to start at John chapter 4, <clears throat> verses 13 and 14. As always, the, it seems like the uh, testimonies and that kind of correlate with what the Lord is speaking to me personally and uh, for the message today. I think the Lord is wanting to, really wanting us to understand some spiritual truths. Uh, maybe this is elementary for some of you, but some others may be not so much, but it's the word of God, so it's all good, hallelujah. So beginning here at John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And then John chapter 19 and verse 28. All this talk of glasses half full or half empty or flowing or not flowing. But after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, the scripture might, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Imagine the water of life saying, I'm thirsty. How can the creator of rivers and oceans and streams and lakes and ponds. How can omnipotence thirst for a drink? The one who calmed the water, who walked on the water, longs for water. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things consist. So the man who is thirsty has all the power of heaven and earth. I'm thirsty. It's got a lot of meaning, church. And Jesus speaks for everybody who's thirsty. For everyone who has unmet desires as yet unanswered prayer there was a wedding the first miracle Jesus performed he turned water into wine he met the thirst the need was met what's interesting to me though is that it was a specific thirst because they had water it wasn't like they didn't have anything to drink. They just didn't have what they wanted to drink. And Jesus gave them the wine. Mm -hmm. So I can't help but believe that his thirst here was more than physical. Yes. Proverbs 17, verse 22. Merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Psalms 42, verses 1 and 2. As the heart panteth after the water.
water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? <clears throat> Jesus' thirst was for the presence of God. Yes. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was always father up until that point. But at that point, he felt abandoned because he was alone. He was rejected. He was being crucified. In the midst of all this, there's a great exchange taking place. He became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was thirsty so that he could redeem us from an eternal thirst. Praise God. A thirst for grace, a thirst for favor, a thirst for the presence of God in our lives. Hallelujah. John 19, verse 28, Jesus said, I am thirsty, or I thirst. He doesn't say I'm thirsty so his thirst can be quenched, but he says I'm thirsty so that scripture can be fulfilled, so that the prophetic words that God had spoken through prophets and others throughout uh, history would come to pass. He, David had prophesied about him being his bones all out of joint, his vis visage marred, and uh, that he would be dehydrated and, and uh, hungered and so on and so forth. And so it was simply, Jesus said, uh, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. So there's a dual purpose here. One, that he's fulfilling the scripture Two, he probably was dehydrated. After all, he'd bled out. He'd been beaten and everything else. And three, he was thirsty for God. Yes. He was separated from his father. He felt abandoned. He felt forsaken. Praise the Lord. I know none of us ever want to admit those kinds of things, but the truth is when prayers are not answered immediately, when we go through things and we're waiting for the manifestation of God, it seems like God's nowhere to be found. Or like, why isn't he listening to this? Or why isn't he involved in this? He has forsaken me. I mean, we don't, that isn't something we testify to in church, but the truth is in the deep, dark moments of our lives, we struggle with these things. We fear these things because we don't have the answer that we need to have that God has promised that he would give us, but it's not there. We haven't seen the, the manifestation, amen? So I wonder, would I have given Jesus water if I'd have been there? He was crying out for thirst. And the best that the Romans could do would give him vinegar, which was just a cheap wine that the Roman soldiers drank. It wasn't going to quench his thirst. It was bitter. But Jesus said, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. Let's look at that, Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 34 and 35. You know, there's nothing in here that is not a revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives. And more than that, there's always, there's layers. I mean, you know, you've read scriptures over and over and over, and then one day you read it, and it, it's all of a sudden, it isn't that it doesn't mean what it always meant, it's just that now it means something even more. Mm -hmm. there, there is a, a light goes off, a revelation, a, a thirst is quenched. Amen. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Verse 40. Just skip down to 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of these, the least of my brethren, then ye have done it unto me. We're talking about how do we pour out the half full glass? How do, we, how do we let the thing flow? How do we let the goodness of God, the grace of God, the reality of God, the blessings of God move through us? Jesus said every time you see somebody that's thirsty, somebody that feels forsaken yes. from God, somebody who feels cut off from God, somebody who maybe doesn't know God or, or ha has had a problem believing in God, they're thirsty, folks, and, and we have the only water that can save them. The Holy Spirit flows through us. Praise God. 
I wonder if our spiritual thirst for God is as great as our thirst for our wants, for our desires, for our personal needs. It doesn't take dying of thirst to mess with my fellowship with God. I can tell you that right now. It just takes a bad phone call. Amen? A, a messed up relationship. A, a, a physical pain. A bad job situation. A doctor's diagnosis. An unpaid bill. All of those things can cause us to question whether God has forsaken us because we're human beings. I mean, I know that God sees me. I, I know that God knows all things. But what I really want to know at times like that is whether God feels what I'm feeling. If he's thinking what I'm thinking, if, if he's anxious about the things that I'm anxious about, and I know he's God and I know he's not, but I wonder if he feels that I'm feeling that. Or is it just I should just, you know, bite the lip and keep on keeping on? I wonder sometimes, does he feel my rejection? Does he feel my sense of injustice? My doubts? Even my thirst? Well, Hebrews 4 Verses 15 and 16 says we have a high priest, but he's not just a high priest. He's a, he's a high priest that feels what we feel, has felt what we feel, has had the kind of thoughts and questions that we have, and he can relate. We don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but one was in all points tempted like we are, and yet without sin. We know he was. He hung on the cross, and he said, where are you, God? Even though he knew he was fulfilling, he felt that total separation from the presence of his Father. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. God has entered our world in Christ. He's felt our pain. He's felt our anxieties. He's felt our doubts. He's felt our sense of failure, our thirst. And he gives us grace so we can know, so we can experience the presence of the Father. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for that both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he's not ashamed to call us brethren. He sanctified himself, set himself apart for that special purpose, for the purpose of dying for the sins of the world. And by that, he sanctified us and made us accepted in the beloved, a brother, a child of God, a brother of Christ. He brings us to glory, to the throne of grace, to the presence of God. You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, and you know, everybody, one of the first signs of birth or life is thirst. Now, you guys are looking at me like, why? But <laughs> your mothers know what I'm talking about. That baby's crying, and the first thing it wants, it, it wants milk. It wants its thirst quenched. We're all born thirsty. But just like we come into this world with physical thirst, we're also born with a thirst that's built into us for God. The thing that Jesus felt for the first time in his life hanging on that cross. I thirst. In Luke chapter 16, uh, verse 23 through 26, and we all pretty much know this story. It's the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man's in hell. At that time, 
there was just a division, a gap between paradise and Hades. Once Jesus took everybody out, hell was swallowed up, or Hades was swallowed up with hell. Paradise was moved to the heavens, to the, to the spiritual dimension where there's no separation, where there's no visibility between the two, where they're now separated. But at the time, and under the old covenant, before the, the new covenant came and, and all those that were in hell that had trusted were in paradise, so they were still under the earth, were taken to heaven, right? Those others were left in hell. So in hell, he lifts up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried, and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from here to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Now, what I, what I guess, what, I'm, what I see here is exactly what Jesus experienced. We have a metaphor here of a rich man and, and poor Lazarus. This isn't about having money or not having money. This is about where you put your confidence, where you put your trust. So the rich man, had his, he was like the guy building a bigger barn, you know? Tomorrow, you know, I'm going to build a bigger barn, and, and, and God said, oh, foolish, foolish person. Look, you don't even know that there's going to be a tomorrow. Yeah. You know, so what do you, you know, you're storing up for here when you should be thinking about there. Now, the guy's thirsty. So I'm, I'm not going to give you a definition of hell. I haven't been there. Don't plan on going. The only thing I know about it is what I've read or heard. That's all I want to know. I don't need to know any more than that. I don't go, I'm not going there. Amen. But here's, here's what I'm saying. Hell will be hot. It'll be dry. How do I know that? Because this guy's thirsty. But it's hot and it's dry and he's thirsty because there's no presence of God. He causes the rain to come down. Amen. He, he's the one that this man is crying out for. The metaphor is water as it was for Jesus on the cross. But it, the, the reality is the separation from God. And hell, people say, well, I'm, you know, uh, I think it was Mark Twain said, uh, hell's where you want to go, or heaven's where you want to go for comfort. Hell's where you want to go to be with your friends. <laughs> Stupid. Because you're not going to enjoy hell no matter who's there. Because it's totally separation from God. We think, see, we live in a world, yes, it's a fallen world, and we know that it is because we see all of the, uh, all the hatred and the bitterness and the divisiveness and and anger and so on and so forth. That's all part of the fallen world. We've fallen out away from the, the true identity that we were created with, which is like God. Amen. Now, those of us who are believers have been redeemed, amen, back to that original condition. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world is still separated from God, but they still enjoy the grace of God and the goodness of God. They don't maybe know it, but without him, they wouldn't even be sucking air. I mean, it, without God being merciful and gracious, this planet would just fall apart. We already read it. Everything exists and consists, was created, and it is held together by God. The moment God would back away, it's all going to disintegrate. That's right. So that's hell. Hell is a place far worse than the worst place on earth. Now, I've never been, I've been to some pretty bad places, but I haven't been to probably the worst places. I don't want to go there. But I do know that there are bad things on this earth. But it's nothing like it could be if God were to pull away and, and, and just take his hand off of it. That's hell. It's a dry place. It's a place where people thirst for the love of God, for the presence of God, for the goodness of God. They'll be dying of thirst, a thirst that will never be quenched, which will never be satisfied, because the living waters are not there. Jesus felt that. Jesus actually went to hell and preached to those captives, but he experienced the, the sensation of hell without actually having been there yet on the cross when he felt a complete separation from God. Praise the Lord. Jeremiah 2, verse 13.
Even when you feel like God is a million miles away from you, as a believer, he's right here with you. He's in you to fulfill his purpose, to complete what he has vowed to do on our behalf, which is not only to give us life, but life more abundant. Amen? And it, and it comes by believing. Yes. The same way we receive salvation in the first place. You can talk about Jesus through all this, but the truth is he believed God, even though he questioned it at the moment, or he'd have never gone to the cross in the first place. He believed that God would raise him from the dead, that he would be seated at the right hand, that he would once again take his position in heaven and in the hearts and the minds of people that were believers. And yet, at least for a moment, he questioned, he wondered, he doubted. He felt what we feel. He thirsted. Amen. For my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You want a picture of the world? That's it. Everybody's thirsty. We said everybody's born into this world thirsty, naturally. But everybody's also born into this world with a tremendous spiritual thirst that cannot be satisfied anyway except by Jesus Christ. No man can come to the Father but by me. I am the truth and the life. I am the way. There, there is no other way but by me. And people look for everything, other religions, other, uh, you know, sex, alcohol, drugs, uh, thrills, jumping out of perfectly good airplanes, whatever your thing might be to get you hyped up and, you know, like li I'm alive, you know. Problem is you're going to come back to earth and you're still separated from God. You still don't have that. You're still thirsty, constantly trying to satisfy that thirst with other things, and that's what the prophet here is speaking of. You, so you're, you're digging your own wells. Instead of, instead of trusting in the water, wells of salvation, instead of trusting in the only true living water, you're trying to create your own. You're trying to satisfy your thirst for God with other things. That's the world we're dealing with. It isn't like they don't want God. It's just they don't know they want God. They're thirsty. They're hungering after the righteousness of God, after the love of God, after the peace of God, after the grace of God, but they don't know it. So they go out and they dig them another well. They chase another woman. They, chase, they get another guy. They, they, they get a bigger car. They go into debt more for a bigger house. They, they go on this vacation. They go on that vacation. There's nothing wrong with vacations or having a man or a woman. You know what I'm talking about, a, a relationship. But when we use those things as a substitute for what we're really thirsting for, we go away unsatisfied. We become bitter. We get angry, not only at ourselves, but at everybody else and at God. Sure. It's, not a, it's not a surprise to me that the world is in such chaos. Right. They're thirsty. This world is living in a desert when it comes to, I'm talking about unsaved people, when it comes to satisfying their thirst. So they can dig, they can dig, they can dig, but they'll never get the satisfaction that they're after until they come to living water, until they come to Jesus. And we have to remind ourselves, even we as believers can dig wells. Instead of trusting in him, we can focus on other things. This ministry, that ministry... When it's God that we need, it's Jesus that we have to have in our life. It's trusting him, it's confidence in him that's going to bring us satisfaction. That's going to satisfy the deepest longings and the deepest needs that we have. Amen. Praise God. Revelation chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. You know what I find out? <clears throat> the more you... The more you look through the scripture, the more you meditate on the scripture, the, the simpler it becomes. You know, it, it's not complicated. Everything is about Jesus and his love for you. Amen. Everything is about the redemption process. Here's what he, he says. They shall no, hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. Neither shall the sunlight on them nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Praise God. Jesus suffered thirst 
so that we could drink from the wells of salvation, so that we would never thirst. That's grace. That's the grace of God. Jesus drank a cup of death so that we can drink from the cup of life. He took judgment. He drank the cup of God's wrath. Listen, anything that happens in this world, and there'll be plenty of crap happen. I'm 68 years old. I've seen a bunch of it already, but it ain't over, praise the Lord. And I don't know how much longer I'm going to be on this planet, hopefully for a good while yet. But as long as I'm here, there's going to be more junk. There's going to be more messes. There's going to be more problems. But the good news is Jesus drank the judgment for all of this so that I can drink from the cup of grace, so that I can come boldly to the throne of grace and be received by God. Amen? God, <clears throat> the next earthquake that comes, the next terrorist attack, the next uh, hurricane, the next uh, whatever it might be. This, this is coming from my mouth, okay? God is not responsible. God is not doing it. We live in a fallen world. It's not God's judgment. It's not God judging America. It's not God judging the Middle East or Africa or Germany or any other country. Wherever anything happens. It's not the judgment of God. His grace is what's hanging everything together, even though it looks chaotic and, and, and crazy. If it were not for the grace of God, this whole place would be a blown-up mess. So God is not judging. God is not going to judge until this is all over, until everybody has an opportunity to accept the living water. Yes. Amen. There's water. Amen. The rain has fallen on the just and the unjust. Amen. The, the snow comes down and so on and so forth, and it waters the earth, and it brings forth. God's word, amen, will not come back to him void as long as there's somebody there who will express it back, who will confess it, who will believe in it and declare it. Bad stuff happens. Bad stuff will continue to happen because we live in a fallen world. But it is a lie from hell that God is the author of it. He, we've heard it said over and over and over. People say, well, they, I thought God's in control. Wait a minute. God gave us control. He gave us authority. It's our responsibility. It's not God gave it to us. We have a earth lease, some have called it. Amen. And I don't know how long that lease lasts. I think 2,000 more or 2,000 years Amen. From the time of Christ, based on my understanding of the scripture. So we're close to the end of the lease. The lease is about to be up. Yes. Amen. And, and God's going to take back authority. And when he does that, the church is going to be taken out of here. The believers are going to be taken out of here. And what's left are the people who have rejected God. Now, judgment falls because all of those who have already been judged in Christ are gone. They're with Christ in heaven. What is left as a remainder here are those who have rejected the living water. Yes. Amen? Now judgment will fall again. But it cannot happen as long as the believers are on this planet. Bad stuff can happen, but it won't be from God. And believe me, there's a big difference between an earthquake and the wrath of God. Amen. I don't care what you know the History Channel tells you. <laughs> Amen. If God wanted to do what God's capable of doing, yeah. this place would be gone in a nanosecond. Yeah. It would be a vacuum. It would be like the worst black hole you could imagine. It would just suck everything into it, and that would be the end of all of it. Yeah. But because of his great mercy and his love, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance, he keeps prolonging and, and, and drawing it out. Yes. Because he knows there's people that are thirsty. And he knows it's the job of the bride to bring him water. Living water. Water that will satisfy. Praise God. Matthew 26, verse 39. I don't know about anybody else here, but I know on days when I'm mowing, it takes about three, four hours to just do the regular mowing at my, at my home. 
takes about an hour and a half or so here at the church. I'll tell you what, I can get thirsty because I sweat like a wild man. I mean, I do. I'm, my clothes are wringing wet when I'm out, and, and Sally will tell you, his grandkids will come up and want to kiss, and, and I got my, what beard I've got going right now here is just full of sweat, and they freak out. <laughs> so I give them a big hug, you know, and just, but I'm just soaking wet. Looks like I wet myself and everything else, and it's just from perspiration. You get thirsty, and you can't get enough liquid back in you. I'll drink two or three bottles of water. I've t I made the mistake of drinking Pepsi. That don't work because it just makes you thirstier. The, sh the sugar in it just makes you want more and more and more. But I'm saying, I know thirst. I know what it's like to be thirsty. I, I, I understand where you you know you get almost dizzy from from dehydration, from from just losing so much liquid and not you know putting it back in fast enough. They say by the time you get thirsty, it's too late. You're already dehydrated, right? So you're supposed to be drinking it all the time. We're supposed to drink deep from the wells of of salvation. We're supposed to be constantly out of our bellies are flowing rivers of living water. We should not be thirsty. We should not we should have such an excess that our the, the, the water that we have, this living water that we have is overflowing. It's like David said my cup runneth over. So people are being influenced even when we're not going up and actually pouring them a drink but we're there in their presence they can, they can receive amen from that Spirit of God, from the Spirit of God Almighty, the, the Holy Spirit, the water, the living water that flows through each and every one of us. We just have to make ourselves available. Amen. Praise the Lord. So he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Jesus was afraid. Go, that's blasphemy. No, it's not. He was tempted the same way. Anybody here been ever been afraid? No. I know not none of you macho men, but uh, you know, a little anxiety, maybe you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. Hey, I've been scared spitless. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've been scared. I've been scared where I didn't I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Jesus was afraid because he knew what was coming. And we're usually afraid of stuff we think might happen. He knew it was going to happen. And he said, but nevertheless, as horrible as this thing can be, I'll still drink the cup. I'm going to drink this cup so that they can drink the living water. I'm going to take death. I'm going to drink deep death so that they can drink deep from the wells of salvation so that they can know the grace of God. I'm going to take the wrath of God so that they can experience the grace of God. I'm going to take the anger and the judgment and the punishment from God so that they can only know God as a, as a father. Praise God. John 18, verse 11. Now we jump from the garden where Jesus is praying and trying to get his disciples to pray with him. Then, he, then we go to this, and this is where they arrest Jesus. And Peter pulls out a sword and chops off the high priest's servant's ear. And Jesus responds to that and he says, Peter, put away the sword. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? He's saying this isn't about escape now. This is about surrender. If I don't drink this cup, nobody, nobody will ever experience living water. If I don't take this cup of death, you'll never be able to experience the cup of life. The cup Jesus feared is the one that he chose. The cup of iniquity. The cup that he drank for you and I. For our spiritual dehydration. John 7, uh, 37 through 39. I like that song we sang. You're thirsty? That wasn't in the song, but he says, just come. He was that, that water that sprang forth from the rock. Jesus, the symbolism and the, the metaphor being Jesus, the rock of our salvation, and the living water that flowed out, followed them everywhere they went when they were in the desert. People with before they had.
had the law, they were operating by grace, and God poured out his living water to them every single day, because they couldn't be filled with it, they couldn't, they couldn't have the Holy Spirit yet, because it hadn't been poured out, but they could receive the Spirit of God, the presence of God, on a continuing basis, every day it could happen for them again and again and again. Whereas for us, it's a one-time experience, and we just live it out after that. But he, in the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So the cup that Jesus took was the cup that none of us wanted, but every one of us deserved. The cup that he pushed aside is the cup that we get that none of us deserve. It's the grace of God. It's the Holy Spirit being poured out, as it was said, on all flesh. And whosoever will believe. Jesus, remember the woman at the well? He told the woman at the well, living water. He said, uh, I'm going to give you living water. He promised it. Because he knew that he personally was going to bear her thirst. So he, he could make the exchange. If you'll drink the water that I, if you, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for water. And I'd give you living water so that you will never thirst again. He could say it because he knew he was going to take her thirst. John 4, 13 and 14. And this is the story of the woman at the well. <clears throat> but just briefly here. Jesus answered, said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now remember, this woman had five husbands. She, she was thirsty. And don't misunderstand me. She was thirsty for love. She was thirsty for relationship. She was thirsty for somebody to give her value, for somebody to care, for somebody to show that she was worthy. And she couldn't find it. She kept looking. And we, you know, we look at people like that and we say, oh my God, just be done with them. No, these are these are people that are thirsty. They're, we don't understand why. We don't, we don't know all of their issues, but we ought to be willing to give them a drink. Yes. Instead of seeing them go to, you know, you, you ever watch J, uh, James Robinson? He's in these third world countries and these poor little kids are they're, they're getting poisoned by the water. You know, they're always digging wells. I mean, that's the world we live in. That's, that's the reality. But that's the spiritual reality of the entire world. We're all sucking from filthy streams that are filled with trash and garbage. And, and we think, you know, we've got to have something. So we take what there is. And here's God wanting to give us this perfect water, this spirit of God. That will give us life. That will make us healthy. That will make us whole. We'll send money there. And we should. I mean, it's good. You, you, we will want to do that. But what about right here? Right. What about the people that are, that are being poisoned by the waters that they're drinking, that they're thirsting for, when it's, there's only one thing that's going to satisfy them? And that's why Jesus said, for every person you give a drink to, it's like you were there at the cross and said, here, Lord. And that's how he sees it. And that's how we should see it. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He is the righteousness of God. We have become the righteousness of God in him. And he's telling us that we are blessed for thirsting after him. Because he's the only one that can satisfy thirst that we have. If you thirst for him, there's a guarantee your thirst will be quenched, will be satisfied. Whatever the need, whatever the lack, whatever the thirst, stay focused on him. He's the fountain of living water. He's the thing that can satisfy, whatever it is. Say, so, well, that's just kind of a sweeping statement. No, it's, it's biblical. It's Bible. It's the truth. He wants to satisfy the dryness of our lives. The spaces that he hasn't completely filled. That he wants to fill. 
And I'm not talking about being a raging, fanatic, nutcase, religious goofball. I'm talking about just trusting and depending on the goodness and the grace and the love of Jesus. Praise God. So, again, I don't know what you're thirsting for and where the dryness might be in your particular life. The lack, the, the yet unsatisfied area, the circumstance, the situation. But here's what I'm telling you. Trust in the grace of God and God's favor for you. Let me close with this. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. He is faithful, and he is a fountain of living waters. You know, you've seen uh, these artesian springs. They just go. They just go and go and go and go and go because there's a, a water source that's goes on forever. I mean, it's like our underground river. It just flows and flows and flows, and then he comes to this arch and then this well, it just comes popping out. And that's what Jesus, that's, the, that's kind of the metaphor that Jesus has given us. There's an endless supply of this living water, and it just bubbles up inside of us and flows out of us as we trust on it, depend on it, believe in it. And the spirit and the bride say, come, let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. So if you're thirsty, come. If you know somebody that's thirsty, bring them to Jesus. Amen? If you know somebody who's struggling, if you can't bring them to Jesus, if you can't get them to come to Jesus, Jesus will come to them. Through you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Take the water of life freely. Trust. Have confidence. Believe. And come boldly to the throne of grace. And to come to the one who was once thirsty, need never thirst again. Because of Jesus and his thirst, God will never leave us thirsty. He'll never leave us or forsake us. But he'll be a well of water bubbling up to give us life day in, day out for eternity. Our dying days are over, church. Amen. Our being thirsty, it's over. Drink deep and live like there's no tomorrow. Because there isn't. We are living in eternity. Every day is right now. We are in God's time. And God is a right now God. It's always today for God. It's always now for God. Amen. He's the God of yesterday, today, and forever because he's always God. And that always God is living inside each of us. And he just says, come and drink deep. Come boldly to the throne of grace because I'll never leave you never forsake you. That's right. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Praise the Lord. David said, he, he fills my cup. In the presence of my enemies, he lays out a banquet, and my cup runneth over. Uh -huh. Amen. Never going to be thirsty with him. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning, would you please? <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. So, Next time somebody says something really stupid and, and hateful and ungodly, just say, you sound like somebody needs a drink. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you need a good shot of Jesus with a, amen. amen, with a Holy Ghost chaser. Amen. Praise the Lord. He'll take care of you. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a great rest of the day. God bless America. Thank the Lord for watching over all of us. Yeah. Amen. Keeping us. And uh, we'll praise him for that for now and forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in his great name. Hallelujah. Yeah.